I, I'd have just mentioned this as we, the, the Beatles become a theme. That um, I interviewed uh, Paul McCartney for the Element. That's it. I just want you to know. That. <laughs> Anyway, Paul McCartney, or Paul, <laughs> I'm just saying, went to uh, Liverpool Institute, uh, which is now Lipper. That wasn't when he went. Uh, I went to the Collegiate, the other, the other end of Hope Street. And um, I asked uh, Paul McCartney, I helped a little bit with Lipper in the early days of Mark Featherstone Whitting, the team who got that together. It's a fantastic school, by the way. Uh, Mark's done a wonderful job, and I, I asked Paul McCartney uh, if he had enjoyed music at school, and he said, no, he hadn't. I said, did your music teacher think you had any talent? He said, no. He does, doesn't he? Uh, one of the other people in the same music program at the school, a couple of years younger, was uh, George Harrison. And uh, I asked uh, Paul if he thought, the teacher thought George had any talent. He said, no. So I said, well, look, because um, part of my argument is that talent is often buried. You have to go looking for it and create the conditions for it. So I said, well, would this be a fair comment that there was this one music teacher in Liverpool in the late 1950s who had half the Beatles in his class? <laughs> and he missed it. <laughs> he said, yes, that's right. <laughs> well, it's a bit of an oversight, isn't it? <laughs> I'm just saying. Elvis Presley, we had Elvis mentioned earlier, uh, went to school in Tupelo, Mississippi. And he wasn't allowed in the glee club at school. They said he would ruin their sound. <laughs> Elvis. Well, we all know what great heights the glee club went on to <laughs> once, <laughs> once they'd managed to keep Elvis out of the picture. And that's the point, isn't it? That, that you know, your life is, you create it according to the talents you discover or not. You, you mentioned the Dalai Lama. And a few years ago, I spoke, I hosted a session at the Vancouver Peace Summit. And uh, he was the guest of honor. So we had about 2,000 people in the room. It was a session called World Peace Through Personal Peace. So we had about an hour you know, to sort that out. <laughs> we were just killing time for the final 20 minutes, to be honest. But, <laughs> but uh, I had to introduce the Dalai Lama. I mean, Herb had to introduce me. You know, but. <laughs> Well, Buddhists, as you know, you, you, you mentioned the great works there. I mean, Buddhists believe in reincarnation. So he's the 14th Dalai Lama. So there's a lot to get in to an introduction, you know, if you're going <laughs> to be comprehensive about it. Um, anyway, I then realized I didn't have to introduce him. Because I thought, if your name starts with V, <laughs> you can relax socially, can't you, at this point? Yeah. <laughs> Doesn't <it> mean. <mean? laughs> Excuse me, which Dalai Lama are you? <laughs> that would be thee. <laughs> anyway, he said a lot of really great things. And, and, and as Mike said, a lot of the great truths have been known since the beginning of time, and they're very simple. But one of the things, he, he was asked a question at some point during this session. And uh, we're also there, 2,000 people, you know, waiting for the, the great man to speak. Uh, there were 12 us, uh, 10 of us on the panel. Uh, I was, say, facilitating it, but he was asked this question. You've got a picture, you know, he's sitting cross-legged on a throne. You know, I did actually ask Herb for a throne today, but did... <laughs> anyway, we did get a sofa with a teddy bear on it, didn't we? So... <laughs> but, but it, no, he's sitting cross-legged, a kind of big wooden chair in it, and uh, with a baseball cap on. And he was asked this question, and he took a deep breath and pondered this for probably about a minute. You know, it's like a long time. And we're all sitting there thinking, this is going to be fantastic. <laughs> you know, this man has the definite article in his name, so it's going to wait till, he, wait till he comes out with this. And then he leant forward, he took a breath, I thought, here it comes. And he said, I don't know. <laughs> and I thought, what do you mean you don't know? You're, <laughs> you're the Dalai Lama. You know, you have the definite article right in your name. And he said, I'd never thought about that. What do you think? What do you think? You see, I love that. It's been a theme of the afternoon, isn't it? that knowledge isn't about what you know, it's about what you don't know. And being prepared to say, I don't know, I'm going to find out. It's run through all the presentations, what you're saying about the restaurant. I don't know, I'll try it, let's see. You know, it's not over, you know, as long as you're alive and breathing, and maybe not even then. 
And, and the, the great teachers, here's, here's one of the world's great teachers, are the people who also learn with their students. It's one of the big problems of education. We're all supposed to know, and if you get it wrong, you fail. And actually, all the great questions aren't terribly knowable, uh, even at the heart of science. The other thing he said, by the way, is, he said a lot of things, but he said that um, to be born at all is a miracle. So what are you going to do with your life? And this really resonated with me. I'm, say, I'm from Liverpool. I'm one of seven kids. And my brother John, who's sitting right there. Put your hand up, John. There, my brother John. Um, I've had my arm around him most of the afternoon. I just want to explain what was going on there. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> Uh, it's, it's so easily misinterpreted. But um, I don't mind if it is, by the way, but, uh, but anyway, that's John. Uh, John has been uh, doing our family tree. It's not much of a tree, truthfully. <laughs> it's a, like a small shrub, isn't it, really, with an <laughs> odd fungus infection in the roots and what we can make out. But, but he discovered that our, seven of our eight great-grandparents were all born in Liverpool in the 19th century within two miles of each other. That's how they met. You know, they ran into each other. That's how people used to meet. You know, life was very local. People didn't travel great distances like you all do. People just went to work and came home. It was a, as far as they could walk, and they would come back again. Um, so that's how they met. Now, you might say, no, that's not the case. You know, you're missing the point. There's a cosmic theme here that you misunderstand. That, you know, the, the cosmos so arranged things that these eight soulmates converge at the same point in the space-time continuum, that they should meet and procreate and continue the process that has led to the miracle that is me. You know, it's, it's a way of thinking about it. I don't think so. I, I just think they had lower standards then, frankly. I think, <laughs> I think people ran into each other in the street and thought, you'll do. <laughs> you know, I, I could spend my life with you without being constantly embarrassed. This will be fine. Because you know, they didn't know Angelina Jolie was in Prospect, you know, or, or Brad Pitt. They didn't have TMZ or People magazine. It was just like the people around. But here's the point, you see. Um, they went on and had kids and... Eventually, my grand, our grandparents were born, and then our parents were born. Uh, you know, something like 50 odd years later, and there was that night in the pub. And here we are, you know, and it's a miracle, Father. But the thing is, I tell you about that because if you think of the chances of you being born at all, they're pretty remote, right, statistically. You know, all the people you had to meet in what circumstances. Think how you <coughs> met your partner if you have one. The circumstances are pretty remote. Think of the things you do and how that came about. Your whole life is composed by the choices you make, the turnings you move towards, the ones you turn away from, the chances you're prepared to risk, the way you deal with your fear or you don't, you know, and in the process you create a life of some sort. And it's a miracle. And it amazes me how little people settle for very often. They go through the whole of their lives in a state of anxiety, thinking, well, if I try it, it won't work. And anyone who ever achieved anything in their lives was prepared to be wrong and make a mistake and try it. And that's how culture progresses, how our lives progress. It's how you build a legacy and have a life in the process. And everyone makes their own choices about that sort of thing. And I just feel that's been one of the great um, features of this afternoon. And this morning, I'm sure, I wasn't able to be here. But we've had lots of examples of people who created very different sorts of lives and affecting people very differently. And it's in the way that we do that that we create a culture. And if we get the culture right, then we create a life that we can all live communally. And my final thought on all this is that's the difference between human beings and the rest of life on Earth. I mean, we are jeopardizing the rest of life on Earth in the way that we're behaving. But the interesting thing is that you know, human culture is always progressing through this power of imagination and creativity. There's a big difference, isn't there, between us and the rest of life on Earth, although we're intimately connected to it and we keep forgetting it. You know, if you've got a dog, you know, your dog probably has all kinds of feelings and may have some kind of imagination. But it doesn't manifest it, does it, in quite the same way. You don't see your dog staring out the window, depressed, reading Camus. <laughs> you mean, and say, do you want to come for a walk? And that. <laughs> no, you go. I'm not in the mood. You go. <laughs> you <know. laughs> because we live in a virtual world. We live in the world of ideas. We live in a world of thoughts and feelings and theories and possibilities. And you know, it's the old maxim that nothing you know, is so powerful as an idea whose time has come. You know, and nothing is so influential as a life well lived. And that's really, I think, what today's been about. And, and I wanted, on your behalf, to thank all the speakers this afternoon, Mike for a wonderful round off, and especially Herb for bringing all this together. So please welcome Herb Kim back to stage. Give a round of applause.
applause for the Sir Ken Robinson for guest hosting this final session. And of course, I've got like to repeat my thanks to all the speakers all day, which have been amazing. I should also add, of course, um, our own staff, the staff uh, at the Everyman who have been, uh, Rob and his crew up there have been busy making sure all the stuff behind us is working well and things like microphones and such like, is Marie, Marie Burns, who is a producer of this year's TEDx. Applause.